Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto is mysterious in the fairy tale, before I start, please support for more amazing content, and do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. And check out the description as well. Let's start the video. The young man traced his finger onto the shared engraving for the two. For all they have suffered, for the all the loneliness and neglect. Their final wish was for their newborn child and their closest friends to live on and find happiness. For now they are gone, they pass on their teachings, their experience and their wisdom to the next generation. The young man took a knee as he placed the flowers down in the middle. For the time, he stayed that way and refused to look up and took in the silence and peace. Although he knew that he had to keep an eye on the future and prepare for both the best and the worst. He couldn't help but to wonder how things could have gone if the past itself was different. As he finally looked up, he took a deep breath before speaking, I know, I haven't visited in a while. Some kind of son I am right. I desert my own guild, and I can't even bother to find the time to visit my own parents. I bet Laxus visits every month or so, I wouldn't blame you if you made him the favorite child mom. He says as he turns to Mordred's headstone. The man sighed as he rubbed his neck, look at me, I can't even go one sentence without saying anything negative. The last thing you two need is for your pathetic son to come back after six years and whine about how much his life sucks. Not like you two had a better opportunity than I had when I was a kid. If it's any consolation, I found this. He said as he pulled out a scroll and placed his palm over it, triggering a poof of smoke to appear before revealing a broadsword with a red handle. I know I might sound naive and pretty stupid for believing in it, but they say this sword was created using a fragment of Excalibur. I don't know how that works, but rumor has it that the sword of promised victory shattered and that Rangaminiad went missing. I bet you're laughing that the old man lost something important to him like that. He said trying to lighten the mood for himself before sighing yet again. Anyways, I'm not here to talk about random stories or anything. I came because, I guess guilt. Self-loathing. I don't know, it was tradition for me to show up every month and during the holidays, but I've been gone for so many years. I guess even a deserter like me wishes for some redemption for all his sins. Mom you were the self-proclaimed knight of magic and the original Titania for that matter. Me, I got a lot of names and you can tell me whether or not any of them are good. He continued to speak while putting the sword away. Anyways, I don't understand how forgiveness truly works. I don't know if you guys are disappointed in my actions and if you really are watching me, if you guys hate what I've become. But if by some miracle you guys still have love for me, then do you think you can give me the strength to return? I don't mean rejoin the guild, but as in facing my past again. I don't want to run away from my past anymore. I just want to find closure. So please, that's all I ask, even if it means you don't want to see my face anymore. The man pleaded as he bowed his head in front of headstones. Boosh. The man's eyes widened as he felt something cold wrapped around his chest. Looking down, he could feel the wind holding him like some kind of restraint. Before it slowly turned warm and he felt something grabbing onto his shoulder. Giving him him confidence and the strength he needs to stand up. He turned only to see nothing was there and no sign of anything attaching themselves to him. What? He asked in confusion. For a brief moment, if someone else was there, they could see that his eyes were red with black sclera. Looking back at the graves he gave a weak smile, well, I hope you at least considered it. Maybe I can come back and play you a song if you would allow it. He said before standing up. Bye mom, bye dad, I really wish you were here with me. I'm all out of guidance. He said before leaving the cemetery. Fairy Tale Guild Hall. Upon arrival, the man had taken a deep breath and looked at the old hall. Looks like nothing had changed within his years of self-exile. It's moments like these when he wonders how things are now. Sadly, he still didn't have the courage to just walk in there. I just gotta make things harder than they are don't I? He asked himself as he pulled something outside of his pocket. At least I can use my specialty to smooth things out before I go in. He says as the item reveals itself to be an ocarina. One thing is for sure, I never stopped loving music. He said. Inside the hall at the same time, things were pretty normal or average as someone would say if they were at the guild right now. Everyone was drinking, eating, fighting, and just having fun in general. No one said that fairy tale had to meet the expectations of proper etiquette or whatever in order to conform to society's norms. And that is what makes fairy tale number one. Or at least that's what Makarov Dreyer preaches. For Lucy Hertfilia, this was sadly becoming more and more of a norm. Not that she complains unless she somehow finds herself somehow entangled into the trouble. Such as Natsu and Grey fighting for no reason whatsoever just as they do every day. It's never a dull day in fairy tale is it? Lucy asked. I'm glad you're used to our usual craziness Lucy. Marahin said cheerfully. Well when you're stuck with a so-called strongest team. Then I guess it's easy to adjust to joining a guild. Lucy said trying to look at the bright side. I'm sure it's not so bad, especially with Urza helping keep them in line. Marahin said. Take this ice queen. 
they could hear Natsu yell. Yeah that really hurt hothead. Gray said sarcastically. You two need to stop acting like children and fight like a real man. Elfman said as he ran in to join the fight. Buzz off. They both said as they punched him away. See, even Elfman knows how to join in on the fun. Marahin said waving off her younger brother's injury. I guess once you join, you'll never want to leave. Lucy said not noticing a sigh from Marahin. I'm glad you think that way Lucy. Marahin said with a bright smile. Although, I wouldn't mind a change of pace for today. Lucy said. Then Makarov jumped up to the counter and grabbed himself a drink, be careful what you wish for Lucy. I told my fellow guildmasters about how we don't care about what the magic council says, and the next thing I know. Your teammates ended up destroying our conference hall. He said with a sigh. I guess you don't need to be the strongest to cause that much damage. Lucy said with a sweat drop. Lucy let me tell you this, there are different meanings of power and having them. There's having it, there's using it, and finally there's knowing how to use said power. Sadly I can't tell what goes on in Natsu's head when he uses that power. Makarov said remembering that while he destroyed Lullaby, he destroyed the conference hall as well. Hey that's not fair, I bet Natsu had issues with controlling his power. Lucy said. That may be true to some extent, but you can never be sure of the results of your actions. But then again, you should never live with regrets and always live every day optimistically. Makarov said. Says the man who worries about needing to retire. Marahin said making Makarov ignore her. The girls laughed off Makarov's hypocrisy while the old man started to intoxicate himself. It was just another day in fairy tale as mentioned before. You never know what unexpected news or trouble would be brought up. At least that's what they thought until they heard the sound of music playing. Song of Healing Majora's Mask. Hey what's that sound? Lucy asked. It sounds like an ocarina. Makarov said gravely. Suddenly, the entire guild started to go silent. With a few members just pausing as they felt entranced by the delicate tune, while a few others were looking confused. Hey dad, what's wrong? Romeo asked. I haven't heard this song in six years. Macau answered as Wakaba started to look a bit tired. What is this? Some kind of lullaby all of a sudden. Wakaba asked as before slumping against the table. Hey Al have you heard this song before? Biska asked. Can't say that I have Biska. Alzac answered as he started rubbing his eyes. So sleepy Biska said as she lied her head on his shoulder. The entire guild slowly started to slump or fall down as they suddenly felt exhausted. Although there were a few who tried to avoid giving in. Then there were a couple of people who tried to stay awake and attempted to stand on their two feet and make it to the door. Levi was one of them and she had tears in her eyes as she could hear the tune play perfectly. I have to know Levi thought as she tried to make her way to the doorway. Jed and Droy would have helped her make her way there if they hadn't been knocked out as well. Makarov sighed as he saw the display, but quickly realized that he didn't feel tired whatsoever, while Lucy had already fallen off of her stool. The elderly guildmaster turned his head to see Marahin also struggling to stand. Why did Mystigan have to appear now of all times? Marahin asked with sorrow in her voice. Makarov got off the counter and helped her sit down and made her give in to the sleep spell. Makarov quickly jumped into the center of the hall and prepared for whomever the enemy is. This was no doubt someone else since Mystigan's sleeping spell is a lot stronger and would have made his way in by now. Clearly this was more of an amateur with some skill in music and basic sleeping spells. The music ended and Makarov narrowed his eyes to see a blonde stranger walking in with an instrument on hand. The stranger was wearing a black suit and tie with a gray undershirt. This individual was either in his late teens or early twenties and also had a long scar over his right eye, which were both green. His hair was blonde and long enough to be tied in a ponytail. You have a lot of nerve striking my guild with a sleeping spell young man. Makarov said keeping a serious face. I apologize, but let's just say that I'm too shy to let anyone see my face after so long. The stranger replies. Then what purpose do you have here? Makarov asked. You don't recognize me do you? Grandfather. The stranger said. Care to refresh this old man's mind? Makarov asked as he gave the stranger a chance. The blonde man sighed, he quickly took off his vest, undid his tie and removed his dress shirt. Had this been a woman, Makarov would be sporting a blush with him having a bit of a perverted side. Although not as much as a certain sage, but that man has been deceased for several decades, leaving the title of super pervert up for grabs. Putting those facts aside, Makarov covered his eyes and felt very uncomfortable about a man stripping for him. At least when Gray did it, it was quick and unnoticeable to the point that the ice mage never noticed he was naked until it was too late. At least Gray also had the decency to keep his pants on half of the time. However when the stranger finished, Makarov was surprised and yet horrified at the same time by what he saw. The stranger had a silver fairy tale guild mark on his upper shoulder, with an X marked over it. However that was just a small surprise compared to the real horror. Towards the spinal area, the stranger sported a large crooked yet horizontal scar. 
It wasn't just some line or discolored marking you would see from a someone who quickly received treatment from a doctor. No this mark was sticking out and had small cracks coming out of it, as if it were disease that was forcefully contained. Siegfried. Is that really you? Makarov asked as he was almost in tears. Yes grandfather. The man said confirming his identity. The elderly guildmaster lost his professional personality, like it ever lasts, and hugged the young man's leg, Siegfried where have you been? Don't you know how worried everyone was? Better yet don't you know what your grandmother is going to do when she finds out you're back? He asked. Siegfried may still seem to be stoic and compassed, but if you've paid attention to his features earlier. You would have noticed that his skin was more pale than Marahin's or a certain snake Sanon who is somehow still alive. I think I came ill prepared. Siegfried stated. You should feel lucky that you knocked out the one person you call your little sister. Makarov said slowly turning serious and letting go. Siegfried looked around before noticing Levy's unconscious form, little sister. He muttered as he approached her. Siegfried carefully picked the petite girl up in a bridal carry. The blonde man sighed at how much she's grown in age, physically she's still the same. He always did tell her to drink her milk, but she always pushed it away. Siegfried slowly carried the girl and gently placed her on a table. I guess out of all the bad there's good. Is it safe to assume everyone had mixed opinions about my desertion? Siegfried asked as if it were a matter of business. Makarov sighed at the tone, it sounded more direct than what he expected, you know, not everyone is the same as before. Especially Mira when a certain incident happened a while back. He said. The Santa was the real angel of this guild. I guess someone with an attitude as bad as Marahin's can't change when she loses the most important thing to her. Siegfried said surprising Makarov. You know? He asked. Siegfried took a silent pause before answering, he didn't bother turning to answer, I visited about a year ago. I wanted to confront my past, but I saw Lysanna's grave and saw how energetic the guild was. I didn't feel like like making things worse so I left and was hired elsewhere. He explained. Siegfried did you really join another guild? Makarov asked with disbelief. No, I didn't. I was hired by someone with a lot more authority. Siegfried said cryptically. Makarov decided to not dig in deeper for now, regardless, seeing as you're too shy to show your face after six years. What brings you back after so long? He asked. Siegfried took another pause before answering, I'm here to take my mother's armor. He answered. I know about the hostility between Fairy Tale and Phantom Lord. I don't want to get involved, but I don't want to risk the only thing I have left of my mother to get destroyed. He said solemnly. I understand, follow me. Makarov said as he leads Siegfried down to the archives room. From there the guildmaster proceeded to go through a small hidden compartment and pulled a couple of switches, you know, your mother and father wanted you to have these by the time you were an adult or deemed you ready. He said as a larger compartment was revealed behind the bookcases. Siegfried watched as he could see his mother's armor and sword on display. Alongside it was the sword that his father carried with him, Belming. Rumor has it that his father Sieg was close to death, but was saved by the spirit of the legendary hero who was also named Siegfried. Back then his father was some no-name that was conceived using the dark side of science for the sake of twisted experiments. The spirit of Siegfried had supposedly gave his spirit to his father and granted the man strength and the will to survive. It was from that day that his father named himself Sieg in honor of the legendary hero who saved his life. Hence why Sieg named his son after the hero because both he and Mordred believed that Siegfried, our protagonist, would measure up to be a great hero. Siegfried approached the Amor and placed his hand on it, you know, your mother was pretty much in a similar state when she first arrived. Makarov spoke up. How so? Siegfried asked. Physically, she acted like a rabid dog. However deep down inside I could tell that she was in pain and full of sorrow. Makarov answered. I don't think you've mentioned the full details of how mom joined fairy tale. Siegfried stated. I didn't did I? I always sugarcoated it knowing how violent she was. To keep it short, your mother was a broken woman on the inside. Back in the day, she would work independently as a mercenary taking on assassinations, bandit exterminations, and just about anything rotating around violence. I would say she was likely going to make S-class within a couple years of joining us. Makarov explained. But she was too stubborn and refused didn't she? Siegfried asked earning a nod. Of course, your mother was very violent and had that stubborn attitude. Naturally I saw that she needed help, but not by means of some psychologist or the need of substances like alcohol. No, she needed something that no one in the world deserves to live without. Makarov said as he went over that fateful day. Flashback X 757. Mordred was on her last limbs as she was fighting the fairy tale guildmaster. The blonde knight was already injured from her previous jobs, and it didn't help that she was restless. Leaving her exhausted without realizing and was ready to collapse at any moment, but she refused to back down from a fight. Especially from some old man that thinks she needs help. What the hell do you know you stupid senile geriatric? 
Mordred yelled as her armor was already heavily battered from the years of abuse ever since she left Camelot. I may be old, but I'm no fool young one. I can tell that you are in pain, you've lived alone for your whole life, but you've worked hard to grow so strong, and yet you've become a shadow of what you once were. Makarov stated. Screw you old man. Mordred yelled as she rushed at Makarov with her sword. Despite keeping herself active after entering Fiori, Mordred was way too hard on herself. Well her form was strong as ever as well updated to keep up with the mages and wizards of Fiori. The abuse she had given herself due to the many missions she's taken and the restless nights where she refused to sleep. Mordred was down to swing wildly and using as much force she could missing the balance of her speed and accuracy. In a matter of minutes, Makarov defeated her via crushing her chest with an enlarged fist. Mordred's chestplate shattered along with part of her helmet as she collapsed onto the ground. In that moment, the former knight of the round table found herself gasping for air as she looked to see Makarov, who had very few scratches on him. Is how I die. Some old geezer finishes me off. Mordred said as she looked up to the sky with teary eyes. Makarov heard her words and sighed as he slowly made his way towards her. He could see the sorrow and grief in the poor girl's eyes. The third guildmaster could only imagine what she's been through that made her this way. This attitude is one of either abuse or neglect and likely decided to make up for it by proving how strong she is. Makarov approached her and extended his hand, what is this? Are you going to finish me off? Or are you too chicken to end it? She asked. There's no shame in showing mercy. Makarov said. Mercy? It's just an excuse for weakness how do you know I won't stab you when you aren't looking? Mordred asked as she gritted her teeth in pain. Because I believe in you little one. You aren't vengeful, but you are angry. I don't know the reason and it's not my place to interfere. But that doesn't stop me from being a good Samaritan. Makarov said as he kept his arm extended. I run a guild in Magnolia Town, it's called Fairy Tale. In my guild, we treat everyone like family. If you join, I'll guarantee that you will be accepted. He said. Mordred scoffed despite being in pain, like hell I would join some random ass guild. Who needs family? My mother used me as a tool, and my father refused to accept me as his child because I didn't have the likes to become a king. Being alone means I don't have to worry about being stabbed in the back or looking out for anyone. She said turning her head to avoid his gaze. So shove that hand out up your ass and leave me here to rot. Not like I'm wanted in this world anymore. She said bitterly. Makarov refused to move, you are Arthur's child aren't you? He asked. Like I want to be related to that bastard. Mordred responds as she refuses to look at him. Whether or not you are some lost prince. No one in this world deserves to be alone. Join my guild and we can give you the one thing that you always wanted. Makarov said in soft voice. What? Mordred asked as she didn't care what he would say next. Love. Makarov said making the knight's eyes water up. It's what you really wanted wasn't it? You didn't want to be used as a tool, nor did you aim to take the throne of Camelot. All you wanted was acceptance and a parent's love. Mordred refused to meet the master's gaze. You left your home and came here to Fiori for a reason. Instead you've let your beautiful armor shatter, your mighty sword dull and ready to crack, and you most importantly, you feel lost and lack a purpose. Makarov said trying to be sympathetic. Mordred whimpered as she heard his words. Please, join my guild and I can make sure you receive all the love and attention you desire. Makarov said before hearing a sniffle. At that moment he heard more sniffling and gasping. Then Mordred proceeded to scream in the air before it turned into a loud cry. The cry itself was Mordred's pent-up hatred leaving her body and releasing all the depression she's felt since she left her home. In that moment Mordred had suddenly found strength in her body and pushed back the pain in order to lunge herself at Makarov in a hug. Makarov smiled as he hugged the poor girl back. End of flashback, Siegfried smiled, despite all the stories of his mother being strong and easily aggravated. All Mordred wanted was love and acceptance, something she was robbed of as a child. It was thanks to fairy tale that she had found what she wanted all along. Makarov took a deep breath before continuing, seeing that now, I can only imagine what you've been through Siegfried. I can only say I'm sorry for not only failing your parents, but you as well. He said as tears fell from his eyes. Siegfried kneeled and hugged his grandfather figure, you didn't fail me grandfather. He said. But the mark on your back, it's the mark of desertion. It's to remind me and to tell others that I failed fairy tale by abandoning it. Naruto said making the elderly man gasp, I've also visited Konoha, the homeland of the boy who you named me after. There I learned about the rogue ninja who abandoned their village and they're identified by a slash marking over their headbands. He explained. I see, well then I suppose you'll be on your way then. Makarov asked sadly. Yes, but don't worry. It won't be a permanent thing. Siegfried said as he smiled before turning back to his mother's armor. As Siegfried placed his hand over the chestplate. A golden magic circle appeared under the armor creating a portal. Makarov watched with amazement as the armor started to slowly sink into the portal. Siegfried continued to do the same with Clarent and Bauming. 
Fairy tale lost Kazuna. Well that's it then. I'll see you around grandfather, hopefully grandmother doesn't feel too angry enough to get a broom made of hickory wood. Siegfried said earning a laugh from Makarov. But by my boy, even though you aren't a part of the guild you still have to remember the most important rules when leaving. Makarov said turning serious as Siegfried watched as Makarov explained the rules. Number 1, you must never reveal sensitive information about fairy tale to others for as long as you live. Siegfried nodded understanding every guild has its secrets. Number 2, you must never use former contacts met through your being in the guild for personal gain. That made sense, it would rupture business and clients within the guild. Most importantly, though our paths may have diverged, you must continue to live out your life with all your might, you must never consider your own life to be something insignificant, and you must never forget about your friends for as long as you live. He said making Siegfried's eyes widen as he completely forgot that rule. I will continue my journey grandfather. Although the scars of the past are there, they will never define who I am and merely keep me from straying from the right path. Siegfried said as got dressed before he went back upstairs and prepared to leave. Makarov watched as Siegfried walked out of the halls. For a brief moment, Siegfried activated a magic circle that created a small shockwave that spread across the hall. That's when everybody started to move again as they regained their energy. Naruto merely continued to walk away as everyone started to recompose themselves. All the while Siegfried knew that some people had already noticed him or already caught a glimpse of him. Just as he made it to the doorway of the guild, Siegfried stopped for a moment as he summoned a golden portal behind him. A sword with a tag came out and Siegfried pulled it out before stabbing it into the ground. With that, Siegfried noticed a red-haired woman heading towards the guild to his right. With that in mind, he turned to the left and continued to move on. End of song, Makarov wiped away a tear as he went to check on Marahin. However it was Natsu who recovered first and wondered what happened. Okay one of these days me and Mistigan are going to fight. Natsu promised as he breathed fire to prove his point. Seriously why is Mistigan so shy? Lucy asked as she was really into the idea of being knocked out when the mysterious maid shows up. As everyone was wondering about whether or not Mistigan had appeared, nearly everyone had forgotten the sound of the music that played earlier. A few certain people sure did, but they were a little too confused as to what they should do. All the while Urza made her way back to the guild hall, only to stop and see the sword that was embedded into the ground. For Urza, the Titania proceeded to rip it out of the ground as she further examined the blade and note. Sword of the Kusanagi, legend states that this blade can never shatter. Master what happened to the music? Marahin asked as she picked herself up. A musician who was playing it left. I'm sorry Mira, but I can't tell you where they went. Makarov said making the barmaid look down. What musician? Urza asked as she approached the bar area. It was nothing Urza, how was your mission? Makarov asked. It was successful, but do you know who left this sword at the doorway? It's a fine blade and it's well crafted. Urza said as she swinged it around almost taking Lucy's head off. Hey careful. I prefer keeping my head on my shoulders. Lucy said avoiding the strikes. Isn't your head attached to your neck? Happy asked. You know what I mean cat. Lucy yelled. Anyways, I wouldn't mind thanking whoever left me this nice gift. Urza said. I'm afraid I haven't seen who left the sword. I briefly left the hall to go look outside, and when I came back, it was just sitting there in the ground. Makarov lied, but none of the guild members noticed it. Pity, I guess I owe a favor to my admirer. Urza said as she sent the Kusanagi to join her other swords. Makarov could only sigh knowing he couldn't tell the truth. Then again he was the one holding back the truth from Siegfried. For it was only after Mordred died that he learned a startling revelation. He wanted to wait to tell Siegfried the truth when he was older, but now it seems like that might take a while longer. But Siegfried a while later, the day was over pretty quickly as the sun set. Siegfried decided to turn in early and visit Perusica tomorrow. The fox found him a while later after doing some much needed exploring. The two decided to rent out an apartment after shopping for a few supplies. Seems like a nice place. The fox said. Yeah, but I doubt we'll be here for so much as a month Karama. Siegfried said as he started working on cooking a couple of steaks. You sound as if you got some job. You're like the Sanin for crying out loud. You just send a few reports here and there, kill some bastards and keep the peace. Karama said as he scratched his ear. Yeah well from the stories you told me, those legendary Sanin don't sound very impressive. One was a pervert who peeped on naked women, another was an alcoholic with a gambling disorder, and the last one was a maniac that conducted human experiments. Siegfried said. Well you were practically buddy-buddy with the snake despite all the shit he put my container through. I don't even know why they kept him alive or why he still looks youthful. Karama said. You sound like that bull-haired guy and his kid. Siegfried said with a chuckle. Whatever, then there's Tsunade who was still hiding behind her hinge. The damn woman treated you like her lost child when we learned about the Triu. Karama responded. Yeah, all my life I've been nothing but a parasite in a charity case. Siegfried said sounding more negative. 
You know the brat would do the biggest and most unpredictable things if it means helping any stranger he comes across. Karama retorted. This is coming from the fox who held him back. Better yet you were the most hostile towards him. Siegfried said as he finished cooking the steaks. Not like we were friends we met. Then again I treated you better since the last brat went through a lot. Thanks to him I have a better tolerance with really annoying people. Karama said as a plate was given to him. Siegfried opened a bottle of apple cider for himself, whatever, whether this is fate or some bullshit. I have my own duties to attend to, and one of them is guarding the damnable sword and restrain the other parasite within me. He said as he took a swing of the bottle. Very tay lost Shukime, so instead of killing yourself like a sensible person, you want to at least try to pay back the world for the fictional debt in your mind. Karama said as he started eating his lunch. I'd die, then the sword will corrupt someone else. Then nothing will have changed, except for more needless destruction. I can tell you this fox, there is no way I or any super-powered individual could ever claim that they can achieve peace, let alone have the power to back it up. All I can do is prevent death and ease the suffering. Ha! Ah, I'm just like the real Siegfried, hopefully Hisui doesn't kill me. Siegfried said before giving a quick prayer before eating his meal. Oh yeah, the knight was killed by a princess for not marrying her or some crap like that right? Karama asked. Siegfried nodded, he wounded a woman's honor by acting courting another woman in place of his brother-in-law. Siegfried ruined his own honor as well as his wife's by doing so, and they called for his death. The complete the expectations of those around you who look up to you, who have you bled for, who you've dedicated your entire life to, and the final request for you to fulfill was your own execution. He explained as he took another swing of the bottle. So the cycle continues, only a different one this time. What does that make you? Some eternal timekeeper. Ashura's successor is dead, and Indra's is going to be knocking on the Shinigami's door sometime soon. The old man wants you to break their cycle. Karama said remind Siegfried of his other burden. Siegfried rubbed his face, is this the life my parents wanted me to live? They named me after the legendary hero of legend. Grandfather Makarov gave me the surname based on the hero of the elemental nations. So what kind of hero am I? He asked rhetorically. The one that stopped a bunch of arrogant assholes that think they're the next Zera for Madaracha. Karama said as he finished up. Well whatever, I think I should head off to bed after a quick wash. Siegfried said as he finished his meal and cleaned up. I'll hit the couch, maybe I'll check out that fairy tale place later. Sounds interesting, didn't you also say that's where there was some dragon slayer kid? Karama asked. Yeah, I didn't pay attention if he was there, but there's no doubt Natsu is still there along with Grey and picking fights. Siegfried answered. I remember you were groveling to Bahamut about Igniel's location. Despite what the idiot put you through and yet you wanted to be friends with him. We never found him regardless. Karama replied. Siegfried sighed, well it doesn't matter. No matter how I look at it or how obsessed I become with the past. I can't do anything to change it, and I need to accept that. He said. Yeah, remember that you're not the only one with regrets of your own. Karama said before jumping on the couch and rolling up. I wonder how that Wendy girl you spoke about is doing. Siegfried thought before taking a bath and preparing for bed. Maybe I'll visit the guild again after I visit grandmother. He thought before sleeping. End of song. The next day, Siegfried woke and prepared himself for the day, I'll be visiting my grandmother. Will you need anything? He asked his roommate. Yeah, could you visit the guild first? I'm not sure if it's related to those magical surges I felt in the middle of the night, but I think they made some strange renovations. Karama said as he pointed out the window. Holy crap. Siegfried said as he equipped some armor and ran out the door. Fairy tale guild hall. Siegfried arrived at the guild hall after pouring a heavy dosage of mana into his legs. Entering the hall, he subconsciously summoned a blue and silver version of his mother's armor before brandishing her sword and going in. Grandfather. He yelled as he started looking around the damaged hall. Siegfried kept his grip on his sword as he looked around only to see the sign pointing down to the cellar. As he jumped down there, he found Makarov fixing himself a drink after setting up in the cellar. Siegfried switched his helmet off and approached the guild master. Grandfather, what happened to the guild? I woke up and found it impaled by metal. Siegfried asked. Makarov sighed, as you mentioned, our relationship with Phantom isn't necessarily the best. You can see the results of that. He answered as a piece of wood fell from the ceiling. I see, now you can't do anything since it would be a war, and with fairy tale being a how do I put this? Having too much freedom, fairy tale isn't exactly in the best light, so no doubt the council would side against you whether it's out of spite or out fear of losing control. Siegfried responded. I see you haven't faltered in your studies while you were gone. Makarov complimented as he offered the young man a drink. No thanks, I don't like the taste of alcohol. Siegfried said as he sat down with a sigh. Well there isn't much else we can do, but sit and enjoy a few drinks. Makarov said as his face was already getting flushed. I understand, you can't do anything unless you have evidence to warrant an assault. 
For now, you can wait it out, possibly sue them for vandalism of private property. Siegfried replied. You're a better lawyer than a mage. Makarov said followed by a chuckle. I needed to pick up on this stuff. Siegfried said. What is that armor by way? Makarov asked. I call it tribute armor, it's based on my mother's armor. Although a few designs might be off since I can't remember the exact design. Siegfried answered before putting his helmet back on as he heard a few footsteps coming down the ladder. Master. I saw the wreckage. Did. Marahin stopped as she looked at Siegfried who was putting his sword away. Pardon me, I didn't know you had visitors. She said politely. Oh um Mira. I didn't expect you to come so early. Makarov said before falling off of his seat and onto the floor. Well I saw the damage and ran here as quickly as I could. Who is this by the way? Marahin asked. Makarov looked a bit nervous, Mira, it's rude to ask someone their name before introducing yourself. He said. Mira blushed before adjusting herself, I'm sorry, I'm Marahin Strauss. I'm the barmaid and poster girl of this little guild of ours. She said with a small curtsy. Siegfried stared at the girl and found it difficult to believe her. There was no way this was Marahin Strauss. Marahin Strauss is a punk who hates elegance and wears her long hair in a ponytail. Siegfried would sooner believe that this is Lysanna with that kind attitude of hers, but her hair is long and held in an upward ponytail. There was also no way said girl would wear a dress and heels. Meanwhile Makarov and Marahin sweat dropped at his silence before he answered, I am Gunter von Franklin. He finally replied. What the hell kind of name is Gunter von Franklin? Makarov thought. I am also very slow to respond to questions. Siegfried added. Oh that makes perfect sense. Marahin said happily. Okay not even the Marahin I know is this absent-minded. Siegfried thought. It's nice to meet you Gunter San. What brings you to our guild? Marahin asked curiously making them sweat. I am here to negotiate business. Siegfried answered. That's right, he's with a publishing company and asked him if he could do a photoshoot for you and some of the other girls. Makarov said as Marahin smiled. You're a model? Siegfried asked. I sure am, you must be new to the industry. Let me guess, some sort of Knights and Swords edition. She asked getting a slow nod. Anyways, I think Master Makarov should show you. I've been doing this for almost two years now. Marahin said as she gestured for Makarov to pull out the magazine. Wow, Makarov pulled out the magazine of Marahin doing her bikini modeling. Siegfried was redder than in Yuzumaki's hair at the side of that. The knight kept playing a mantra in his mind that said, this is not Marahin. This is not Marahin. Over and over. How would some punk little girl suddenly become nice and friendly while strutting her voluptuous body? Did I just think voluptuous? It's a good thing they can't see my face. Siegfried thought as he was still red. Um, that's very important to know. I'll finalize the details at a later date. He said as he went up to the ladder. It was good seeing you Gunter San. Come back soon and enjoy a drink while you're at it. Makarov said with a wink. Sure, I'll be back, but I have a long list of things to do first. Siegfried replied as he tried his best to leave as soon as possible. He was a nice guy. Marahin said as Makarov scratched his head nervously. Back upstairs, Siegfried shook his head and sighed, a photographer really. A guy in armor shows up and he calls me a photographer of all things. He asks himself before heading out. Since I can't do anything here. I guess a visit to Granny is in order. He said as he stepped out the door just as several guild members made their way into the hall, narrowly missing the last piece of their broken puzzle which they call history. With Pruyusika, a while later, the pink-haired medical mage and personal medicinal advisor of the fairy tale guild was enjoying the serene peace, all while drinking her favorite brand of tea. For one day, she enjoyed the idea of not having anyone over in her treehouse. Knock knock, Pruyusika was sadly mistaken if she believed that such peace would last any longer. After muttering up a few curses, she stood up and went to the door. Pryusika hated humans for several reasons despite being one herself. It wasn't a sense of superiority or anything, it was mainly that she felt as if others had the intelligence of Neanderthals. I'm coming, I swear you youngsters don't have respect for someone else's personal time. Pryusika says as she opens the door to find some familiar armor. The medicinal advisor blinked twice as she studied the armor, Mordred. It can't be. Who are you imposter? She demanded. The helmet retracted revealing Siegfried's face, hello grandmother. He said. Grandmother? Young man I believe you have me confused for someone else. Pryusika said before studying the young man's features. Siegfried sighed, I guess leaving for six years can change someone. Especially their physical appearance and personality. He said. Pryusika's eyes narrowed for a moment before they went wide. In front of her, the tall scarred man intertwined with a vision of a small boy full of hope and innocence. The pink-haired doctor covered her mouth as tears came out of her eyes. Siegfried soon found himself embraced in a tight hug. My little Naruto, you've come back. Pryusika said as she cried onto his chest. 
Siegfried quickly switched out of his armor and into his suit before hugging her back, nobody has referred to me by that name in so many years. He whispered. Beryusika wiped her tears away before adopting a more serious look, that reminds me, where have you been young man? The world isn't a place for a child to roam around. Better yet, where in the world have you been? Don't you know how many people went looking for you? She asked. I understand what I did cannot be forgiven, nor can I give a valid reason for leaving. Siegfried answered in a regretful tone. Beryusika didn't feel well, the little boy she knew was innocent and always full of energy. This person was a grown man with a properly developed vocabulary. Those jade eyes didn't belong to an optimistic happy-go-lucky child, they were the eyes of a man who had seen the dark side of the world and the secrets it held. Along with many other emotions that she wasn't able to see as if Siegfried was blocking her from reading his thoughts. But that Perusica sighed as she rubbed her temples, come inside then, we have a lot of catching up to do. She said. Siegfried sat down on an open chair by her table, where do you want me to begin? He asked. The beginning, where it all started if you will. Perusica suggested as she started warming up some water for more tea. Siegfried took a deep breath before speaking, I guess it began when my scar reopened. Then the nightmares began and although I overcame the false illusions years later, all I could see was Urza piercing my chest with a ball of lightning. He said as he began his tale. Later at night, at the guild hall, I can't believe the old man. If it were up to me, we would be beating the crap out of those phantom jerks. Natsu claimed furiously. We can't be picking fights without putting the guild at risk Natsu. So just shut up already. Gray said. Watch who you're talking to Snowball. Natsu argued as he got into Gray's face. Make me match light. Gray argued back. Enough you two. Bickering amongst each other will only make things worse. Urza yelled as she slammed the table making the two shut up. Aye. They both said. Hey guys are we breaking into Lucy's apartment to hang out with her for the night? Happy asked. Of course, why wouldn't we? Natsu asked. It would be a health hazard to stay at Natsu's house. Urza said. Then let's go. Happy said knowing Lucy already left for her apartment. Meanwhile Team Shadow Gear had already left the guild as well. One by one, several groups left together in hopes of avoiding any potential threats from Phantom Lord. While well, Makarov was optimistic about things settling down between the two guilds. There was no telling what the opposing guild is plotting. Back with Perusica and Siegfried, and that just summarizes everything until now. The real details are a lot longer, but I suppose I could explain the rest in my letters. Siegfried said as he summoned a small book and revealed a stack of letters. Perusica looked worried as she grabbed his hand in a comforting manner, I understand, but don't be afraid to visit me Naruto. I may not enjoy being around humans, but I'll always make an exception for you. She said. Thank you grandmother. Siegfried said with a smile. And stop this grandmother and grandfather nonsense. Where is the little boy who called me granny? You may act different, but you're the same person Siegfried Naruto. Now go on then, you should be spending the night with friends or with a pretty girl by your side. Perusica said. I think I'll prefer being by myself until I'm more comfortable around others. Maybe I'll also go back to being used to others referring me by my surname. Siegfried said. You better, it's how everyone knows who you are. Although, you should keep the suit. You look more handsome this way than with all that orange. Perusica added. Sure, I'll see you tomorrow. Siegfried said as he left. Perusica wiped a tear from her eye, I can only imagine what you think about what your son has been through mortared. Perhaps with a new outlook, he could succeed Makarov and that rambunctious guild of his. She thought. I think so long as I'm with him. Nobody will have to worry anything stirring the kid right from wrong. If anything, I'm going to help him become the next guild master, Dadabeo. Said a voice only Siegfried could hear. Of Team Shadow Gear, the three, not so strong, guild members were making their way across Magnolia Town. The setting was dark, and it appears as if everyone else in town had already returned home and likely turned in for the night. Are you sure this is okay? Jed asked. Shouldn't you be staying with Lockie and the others at the girls' dorm? Droy asked. It's fine, I don't want to split up our team. Levy said optimistically as the boys swoon. The three of us can face anything together. Droy said. I'll always protect you. Jed added. The two then continued to argue before a figure hidden in the shadows jumped out from hiding and struck. But Siegfried, I know, transitions are annoying. The blonde was making his way back to his apartment after having his long talk with Perusica. It was pretty exhausting, both emotionally and physically. So all he wanted was to grab a quick bite while and ignore the fox before heading off to bed. Only to be interrupted by an ear-shattering scream. Ah. Siegfried's eyes widened and he knew trouble when he heard it. Equipping his tribute armor, he dashed to the sound of screaming. Upon arrival, he found a long dark-haired man with red eyes with slitted pupils. Siegfried stared at the horrifying sight and saw the man beating three people to near death before trying to brand one of them. Drop the marker and hands in the air filth. Siegfried ordered. 
The man got up and turned around to reveal a grin, what the hell are you supposed to be? The knight of the round table. He asked with a chuckle. Red Fox, you're the Iron Dragon Slayer of Phantom Lord. What the hell do you think you're doing attacking random citizens? Siegfried demanded as he summoned Baoming to his side. They aren't some random citizens I swear. I'm just clipping the wings of a few fairies is all. Gadgil said as he gestured to three unconscious and mortally wounded members of Fairy Tale. Siegfried looked and his eyes were widened, Levy he got Levy Jet Droy he thought. So can I go now MR Lawman or whatever you're pretending to be. I gotta celebrate with my pals back at Phantom. Gadgil asks as if he just finished a late shift at work. Levy baby sister she was in trouble Siegfried thought as he moved past Gadgil. I guess I'm free to go. I was going to nail them to the tree, but Siegfried's eyes widened as they started to glow red, Levy needed me. The wise man said did say that art is never finished. So why bother? Gadgil asked as he started walking away. Out of all the people I hurt all the blood I spilled all the missions I've taken I've failed, you Siegfried thought as he watched Levy's breath heavily. Later King Arthur or Gawain or Lancelot or whatever. Gadgil said giving him a wave without looking back. Levy dear little sister I promise I won't fail again, I will I will Siegfried thought as dark energy surrounded him. I will avenge you. He yelled as his eyes turned red with a black three-sided shuriken before the darkness engulfed him. Agile turned back around to see the transformation, um Sir Galahad. Something wrong? He asked. The darkness receded and revealed a dark blue armored man with a horn going through his helmet with his ever-burning red eyes. His arm looked like it mutated and part of his chest and shoulder looked like they had mouths with sharpened teeth. The armor overall looked old and cursed which kind of creeped the Iron Dragon Slayer out. You're one ugly son of a bitch. Gadgil said despite not being able to see past his helmet. You will pay for what you have done. The beast said as he charged at Gadgil as he summoned a new sword. Into the woods ost fight or flight. Gadgil quickly blocked the sword slash by coating his arms in iron, if it's a fight you want, it's a fight you get ugly. Iron Dragon Sword. He said as he jumped away and turned his arm into a saw-like mechanism. It doesn't matter how much you struggle. The creature said as their respective swords collided. Agil proved to have a great deal of strength and some agility when battling, but despite their heavy appearance. The creature that Siegfried had transformed into was not slow or weighed down by his heavy blade and continuously forced a dragon slayer to keep his guard up. Gagil attempted to land a few slashed before going directly for the chest, only to be stopped by the monster's hand. Applying more pressure, he forgot about the sword in his other hand. Agil narrowly avoided being stabbed while only taking a small wound around the hip. Taking the time to strategize, Gadgil reverted his arm back to normal before switching to a new form. Iron Dragon's Club. He yelled as he sent a sideways kick towards the beast which transformed into a giant pillar of iron. The creature in turn tried to block the attack only to be sent crashing into a nearby building. Gadgil smirked as he ran after his opponent before switching the club with his arm and smashed it down the building making it collapse. Just for good measure, he put his hands over his mouth before calling out his attack, assuming it would finish his opponent off. Iron Dragon's roar. He invoked sending a powerful tornado over the debris. Immediately crushing what was left and likely ending whatever was underneath it. Gadgil chuckled to himself, ha, so much for that loser. Just some random one of night with some demon transformation. He probably did it for some stupid chivalry or something. He said before leaving. That's when suddenly a giant purple skeleton's arm came out and grabbed him, Susanu. The beast yelled as he got out of the rubble and punched Gadgil with another skeleton fist. Agil found himself in an ironic situation as he crashed through a tree and straight through a building. Looking up, he saw the beast high in the air, aiming to stab him with that freaky sword of his only to miss. So ledge. Grant me strength. He told the sword as an eye revealed itself on the sword and started glowing. Agil steeled himself, iron dragon's roar. He yelled again only for the beast to be surrounded by a purple ribcage keeping him in place. Iron dragon's club. He yelled out as he aimed to hit him again. Only the beast's side stepped at the last minute and revealed the three-sided shuriken symbol in his eyes, Amaterasu. He said. Agil was a couple of hairs away from having his face burned off, but the same couldn't be said about his arm. The area that bordered around the arm becoming iron was directly hit. Gagil let out a loud howl of pain as he fell on his knee as the black flames burned his flesh. That was enough of an opening for his foe to slash at him a couple of times before being picked up and tossed into another building. Become a part of the nightmare. The creature said as he slowly approached Gagil. Nightmare ha. Huh? Is that your name? Gagil asked before being lifted up by the monstrous arm. I'll take that yes. Iron Dragon's mallet. He said as he aimed his hammer-shaped fist towards his helmet. Nightmare was able to block it in time, but not without a sense of struggling. Nightmare was having enough of these foolish games and proceeded to smash Gagil's body into a wall a few times. Gagil was starting to feel a bit of light head and attempted to hit him a few more times, only to be roundhouse kicked into the ground before being stomped on. 
Iron Dragon's kunai. Gajil yelled as he tossed a bladed weapon directly at Nightmare who caught it before slowly bending it in half. Iron Dragon's sword. He yelled as they continued to clash with their swords. Heh, not bad. You're a pretty tough opponent. What's that sword you're holding? He asked. So ledge, you're ending. Nightmare answered as he headbutted Gajil who headbutted him back. Come on, hit me harder. Gajil demanded as he swung down his sword only for it to be blocked. The ground beneath Nightmare started to crack as he blocked the attack with Soul Edge. However this wasn't the end for the demonic looking knight. Nightmare looked up and used all the energy in his body to push back, shoving the Iron Dragon Slayer away. With a few more slashes and parries, Nightmare brought down his sword once more on Gajil. Shatter. Nightmare said as the iron started to crack, making Gajil's eyes widen. During this surprise, Nightmare made several hand gestures with one hand, fire style. Grand Fireball. He said his giant ball of fire appeared and hit Gajil directly. Gajil stepped out of the flames with a smirk as he dusted himself off revealing his body had turned into iron, I prepared for a potential fight with a fire mage. After all, I always wanted to fight another dragon slayer. You'll have to do for now. He said as he raised his fists. I want to hear your anguish. Nightmare said as he charged at Gajil who managed to block the attacks before repeatedly hitting Nightmare and sending him and making him slide against the concrete of the ground. So much for a nightmare. Is your fancy sword and fire all you got? Gajil mocked. Nightmare adjusted himself before cracking his neck, this is only the beginning for the nightmare will never end. He said before disappearing in front of him. The FFT cowered. Gajil said only to be slashed from behind and coated with black flames. Looking back he saw nightmare behind where he was standing, what? How did you do that? He asked as he slid against the ground before blocking more sword attacks. I've had enough of you. Iron Dragon's roar. He yelled. Nightmare was suddenly replaced by a log confusing Gajil even further. That's when he saw several kunai heading towards his way. Gajil didn't worry about them until he saw strange paper written in kanji that was on fire. That's when they blew up and the explosion was powerful enough to make him collapse onto his back before Nightmare landed a powerful punch on his abdomen, making him cough up blood. Gajil snarled as he ran up to Nightmare, Iron Dragons, Amaterasu. Nightmare said as large tornado of black flames surrounded Gajil making him yell in pain. What the hell is this? How hot are these flames? My skin feels like it's a baked potato. Gajil yelled as the flames continued to burn. Inferno style. Flame control. Nightmare said as Gajil was hit by the flames before being sent into the air and pierced by them. Gajil choked up more blood as he collapsed, I I can still still fight he muttered only two for Nightmare to stomp on his back repeatedly. End of song, Susanoo. Nightmare said as the skeleton arms appeared and started hammering on him. This is the end. Perish. He said before spinning Gajil in the air and tossing him across town, followed by the sounds of concrete being destroyed along with other debris that are in the way. That is the end of him. Nightmare said before falling on his knees and clutching his head. No. I refuse to lose control. You are my sacrifice Siegfried. Yuzumaki cannot protect you forever. He yelled as he transformed back into Siegfried. Siegfried gasped for air and he began to pant and cough uncontrollably. All the while he dragged himself towards a puddle on the street. Looking at the puddle, he briefly saw Nightmare staring him down before it reverted to his original appearance. Is there hope for me? Siegfried asked himself as he painfully stood up by himself. Levy. He said with wide eyes before dragging himself back to the scene of the crime. Arriving there, Siegfried found himself back to the original side of the battlefield. Luckily Levy and her teammates weren't harmed any further. Thanking for whatever deity or spirit watched over them, Siegfried slowly cradled the petite girl's body. Tears started to well up in Siegfried's eyes as he watched her injured form. Fate Zero Ost Fate and Tragedy. It's okay Levy, big brother is here now. I won't let you or your friends get hurt anymore. He said as he picked her up in a bridal carry. Those two need medical attention as well. Clone magic. He said as Hiraze turned the back of his fist at them making an orange magic circle appear. Suddenly two Depelgingers of Siegfried manifested through two orange magic circles. The two knew their jobs and proceeded to carefully pick up Jed and Droy before running off towards the nearest hospital. At the hospital, it was a long process, but a lot of arguing and threats later. Siegfried managed to get a room for Shadow Gear to rest in. The blonde man gripped his head as he watched members of his guild. I didn't think twice about transforming. Siegfried thought. I shouldn't have came back, but if I didn't these three would be dead. He thought before he started gripping his pants. What the hell is wrong with me? He wondered as tears escaped his eyes. You need some sage advice. Asked a voice. I could use any advice right about now. Siegfried thought. Well you're lucky I'm here Sieg. I'm the greatest sage there is in Fiori. The voice claimed. What? Are you going to tell me to feel better by looking at naked women? Siegfried wondered. You. No. 
I'm not a pervert and I'm definitely not a super pervert like pervy sage. Geez, learn to let up a little. The boy said. Just be quiet and leave me alone. Siegfried thought. Listen kid, I know what it's like to be alone. Trust me, it's the last thing you need and I've been having to help you since day one, then again if I'm anything like Jurea sensei, I haven't done a good job. The boy said sounding sheepish. Anyways, wasn't it loneliness that almost killed you a lot of times? The voice asked. And when I wasn't alone, I lost someone important to me. Siegfried thought. We've all lost people kid. My parents were killed and I didn't even know who they were until a few months before I croaked. Although, what the hell was up with me not knowing who my mom is? I literally haven't heard the names of any other Hokage besides Granny and the old man, yet somehow knowing about the Uzumaki clan is bad. Come on. Really at least you got to know who your mom was. Furthermore, shut up. Siegfried thought coldly. Sorry, I guess I'm like my mom and a bit of a motormouth. Anyways, as I was saying, my teacher, the old man and even Niji died. Although maybe Niji was probably more of a friend than the old team. Anyways, my other teacher, Kakashi Sensei, he was kind of a screw up and I'm not afraid to admit that. So was Gram at Tsunade for a while. The voice explained. Where are you going with this? If you're just going to ramble, then leave me alone. Siegfried practically demanded. The voice made a sighing noise, kid, what I'm trying to say is you shouldn't stay in the past. I know you mean well and you're trying, but change takes time and you should give it some effort to leave the past behind and focus on your future. Seriously, what if you didn't come back to Magnolia Town yesterday? The voice asked. Was I this difficult or better yet, were you this difficult? Come on, we're the same guy and you can't lighten up. I think the world wouldn't want me around if I was like you are right now. Hell, you're only two years and a half years older than I was. What I'm trying to say is, you need to open up. You can't keep running or blaming yourself. You weren't in control of any of this. The voice explained in a solemn tone. What would you know? Karama was out of your hands. The Akatsuki out of your hands. Even the deaths of your friends. He wanted to shout, but knew others would come in and look at him like a madman. I chose to leave. I went on the trip because I wanted to. I got reckless. I took the sword and became a literal nightmare. What gives you the right to decide when and where I have free will? He yelled internally. I see my words didn't get through to you. I guess I still have a lot of learning to do myself. But before I go, let me tell you this and listen good because I'm not repeating myself. The voice requested in a somewhat depressed tone. Pine. Siegfried thought as he was already done with this conversation. Like I said you can only change the future and you should change how you've seen things. Because now, you have family to protect. Even if they want to shun you, even if they still hate you, you can still prove them wrong like I did. Fairy tale is a family, and family never turns their back on each other. Sieg, you're stronger than you realize, and it takes guts just to admit your mistakes alone before trying to fix them. With that, I leave you to think on what you should do next. Sayonara new Naruto. The boy said as he disconnected himself. Naruto Uzumaki, you left your will of fire to me, and yet here I am being a mess. Siegfried thought as he looked at his sister figure's sleeping form. All the while he could see Levi moaning, most likely from the pain, shush now Levi, you're safe for now. I won't let anyone hurt you anymore. He said before kissing her forehead. Siegfried sighed as he summoned a golden portal revealing a large mail packet. The blonde man opened the packet and pulled out a couple stacks of letters all addressed to the same person. He smiled as he placed the letters on the bedside table next Levi. I know you aren't like most girls Levi. So instead of flowers, although that would be appropriate for this moment, I got you some reading material. Out of anything, maybe a few memoirs of a sad man will cheer you up. Siegfried said as he stroked her long blue hair. Goodbye little sister, I have to leave you now. Peace is only temporary after all. He said. For a brief moment, Levy opened her eyes and turned her head to the side of a blonde blurry figure walking out of her room before losing consciousness again. The next morning, Phantom Lord Guild, as everyone in the guild was laughing and having a good time. They were all boasting about Gagiel's assault on the guild and how he would come back victorious after attacking a couple more members of Fairy Tail. Only they were interrupted by the man of the hour who was gripping his shoulder and had a large bruise on the side of his face with a few burn marks on his arm. Hey Gagiel, some of the fairies give you a hard time? One member asked. I don't want to talk about it. Now someone get me some metal. Gagiel demanded as he was too tired to argue or get some metal for himself. When it arrived, some more guild members decided to continue pestering him, don't tell me they were too rough for you. You're the Iron Dragon Slayer for crying out loud. One said taunting him. I bet he got scared for a cold Iron Dragon. You sure have cold feet. One more said before being punched into the ground. Don't bother me when I'm eating. Gadgil yelled as he felt bitter as he continued eating. Freaking good for nothing chivalry. The last thing I needed was some one of night with balls and might to match his words. He thought before punching and smashing the table. 
I swear I'm going to kill him the next time I see him. Demon or whatever he is. He internally promised. So much for a dragon slayer. Another person walking towards the doors muttered before it was blasted open. Holy hell. Someone said as the nearby guild members got into defensive positions despite being unable to see past the smoke that was created by the explosion. It's fairy tale. I knew it. One more person said. I guess Gagiel still managed to piss them off. One said jokingly. Gagiel shoved the rest of the iron down his mouth before getting up, move aside, I feel like kicking someone's ass. He said as he cracked his knuckles. The smoke started to clear up revealing Siegfried wearing crystal armor and holding a large blue sword with a blue orb floating in the middle. Siegfried looked displeased as he made his way inside the hall and stared each one of them down. An. Soul Calibur 4 Siegfried armor, Soul Calibur sword as seen in Soul Calibur 3. This is Phantom Lord is it not? The guild that attacked Fairy Tail. He asked. Yeah, what are you? Some new recruit. You think you're hot shit? Asked one of the guild members. I am here to claim my vengeance and to send you sinners to hell. Siegfried answered as he flared a mysterious energy forcing most of the guild to fall on their knees. I know it was not Gagiel who came up with the idea to attack the guild. A wild animal such as him has no mind of his own. He added. Gagiel snarled as he knocked over his guildmates, are you going to talk all day or are settling this? He asked. Siegfried closed his eyes before opening them again revealing his sclera turning black and his eyes turned red with three black tomos, we will settle this dispute like the mongrels we are. Anyone who gets in my way will not be spared. He threatened as he pointed his sword at the iron dragon slayer. Thus a new faction had joined in the war. The nightmare returns, build hall. Makarov was beyond furious, he visited Levy and saw her current state and couldn't hold his fury in. He quickly returned to the guild and announced his plan seeing this tragedy take place. I can take our headquarters being reduced to rubble. But I will not let harm come to my children without seeking revenge. We have no choice but to go to war. Makarov exclaimed as he shattered his staff. The guild master thus gestured for the guild to follow him as everyone yelled in agreement. Soon leaving the town and headed towards Phantom Lord hoping to gain vengeance for their fallen comrades. Fairy Tail already failed a family member once and they refused to allow it to happen again. At the same time at Phantom, Soul Calibur 3 Ost Forsaken Sanctuary, all that could be heard was a lot of heavy metal clashing. From two sides, Siegfried and Gajul clashed many times before locking their swords together before being pushing each other away. So is this the real you or something? Gajul asked as he tried to hit his opponent with an iron leg. I am very real and I won't hold back as I did with Nightmare. Siegfried claimed as he sweeped the dragon slayer's legs and kicked him while he was in the air into a bar table. Well I promise you, this ain't going to end the way it did last time. Nobody tosses black steel Gajil like garbage. Gajil said as he created his iron sword technique again. The two desperately continued their assault against each other, hoping for speed and brutifers to be enough. Only it continued to be a stalemate for a good few minutes, with neither showing any sign of fatigue. However a few arrogant phantom members decided to jump in thinking the intruder was distracted and started to slow down. Instead, Siegfried activated his eyes and set them ablaze with a Matarasu. What's up with the freaky eyes? Gaji asked before slamming his fist into Siegfried's gut, causing him to hit the floor. Siegfried recovered and blocked several more attacks before slashing at Gaji a few times with no success, these are cursed eyes. Was all he said. Cursed eyes? What are you some goth that wears bright colors? A colorful goth. Gaji asked as he slowly dwells further into confusion. Enough talk, lightning style. Electromagnetic murder. Siegfried said as he formed a few hand seals before sending a giant wave of electricity at Gagiel who crashed into his guild mates. That's when more phantom members got up and prepared to attack, hey don't forget about us you wanted. One yelled. I didn't forget, I chose to ignore the filth. Siegfried said coldly as he formed several more hand seals. You're dead. Many of them yelled as they prepared to charge him. Higher style. Phoenix flame jutsu. Siegfried called out as a barrage of fireballs came out of his mouth and scorched his opposition. What the hell? Is he from the elemental nations or something? One asked before being kicked in the gut. Agile got up and quickly returned to continue the fight, I don't care if he's from England. I'm ending him. Iron Dragon Sword. He yelled as he tried to saw Siegfried in half. Siegfried lifted Soul Calibur over his head to block the attack and raised the back of his fist, clone magic. He called out. All the clones spread out as Siegfried managed to push Gajil off, on the count of three, one, two, three. Fire style. Fire Dragon Jutsu. They said as several large flames in the shape of dragons aimed for Gajil. Iron Dragon's roar. Gajil yelled as he managed to put the flames out. You're mine. Iron Dragon's mallet. He yelled as he tried to slam his hammer down on his head. Siegfried looked impassive and quickly formed one seal. As Gajil landed the attack, he grinned as he heard flesh being squished and a couple of bones being cracked. 
only to snarl as he saw some bald guy with sunglasses. Bad ahel gahil. What the hell gajil? Bose asked before his head fell back and hit the floor. Hey I know I like kicking your asses, but who's the funny guy that put him there? Gajil asked as he looked around for Siegfried. Siegfried suddenly appeared from behind and landed a roundhouse kick behind Gajil's head, making him crash into a table. Gajil nursed his head right before rolling away to avoid being impaled by Soul Calibur. Siegfried lifted his sword up and exchanged blows with Gajil until the two slid back. Putting his sword down, Siegfried and his remaining clones formed a familiar hand seal. Fire style. Fire dragon jutsu. The Siegfried said as Gajil made a cross with his wrists. Iron dragon scales. Gajil said as he survived the flames without a single scratch. Are you really going to do the same trick again? If that's the case, then I'll kick your ass and be done with it right now. He taunted. Siegfried lifted his hand and gestured for the clones to distract the Iron Dragon Slayer and a couple of them to defend him from the Phantom Lord members. As the fight continued around him, he started going through some more hand seals. Only this one was more sensitive because of two reasons. One this was dangerous and required focus despite it being stiff. The other reason just created some bad memories that are too hazy, yet still too painful to think about. But that, he had to block out all the sounds of heavy fighting. In that moment, he saw Gajil down to one clone to fight, and the clone was applying all the pressure he could to keep Gajil down. Siegfried took one more breath before the sound of chirping birds were coming from his hand. In that moment he applied a lot of magical energy into his legs, making his speed increase. Gajil managed to cut down the clone only to notice the electric sparks and sounds of chirping birds. He grinned as he was about to ignore the attack. Didori. Siegfried yelled as he slammed his palm onto Gajil's chest. Heh, was that supposed to do some HHH? Gajil yelled as he felt the intended effects. Siegfried wasn't intending to pierce through the animal, he was being smart and used the power of science. The man who gave Siegfried his new eyes taught him many things, but Siegfried alone was fairly intelligent and understood things such as the elements. Iron, as Gajil claims that he can use, is full of atoms, and his iron scales are just a replacement for his real flesh. Overall, well this technique is meant to pierce the skin and kill the enemy by hitting a vital organ. Siegfried decided to experiment with the jutsu and decided to spread the lightning instead of using it as a drill. Once again, Gajil knew what it felt like to be inside of a toaster as his entire body was being cooked alive. But that, Gajil twitched several times before falling on his back and twitching some more. What the hell did you do? I'm hurt and yet my scales are still good. Gajil asked. I used science. This is your end. Siegfried said as he stabbed his sword into the iron scales. Heh, you hurt me with the lightning. But it's still like poking a brick with a toothpick. Gajil said arrogantly. Siegfried ignored him and was about to apply more pressure with Soul Calibur when another explosion took place. With the knight distracted, Gajil quickly recovered and sweeped Siegfried's legs. I wonder who did that. Gajil said as he turned to the source. Fairy Tail is here. Makarov yelled as he grew exponentially as Fairy Tail ran in fighting Phantom Lord as they managed to defeat the remaining clones. Looky here, more fairies with wings to clip. Gajil said only to be slashed from behind. Hey I thought you knights were supposed to have a code of honor. Who hits a guy when his back is turned? Gajil yelled. There is no honor among mongrels. I am no exception. Siegfried said impassively as he changed his current armor with his tribute armor. Gajil jumped toward Siegfried with his sword spinning. Siegfried slid under Gajil as the two weapons clashed making the sparks hit the ground as they fought. Both quickly stood up and continued their sword fight until Natsu arrived yelling at the top of his lungs. Move out of the way. I want to fight the dragon slayer. Natsu yelled as flames erupted from his mouth. Gajil and Siegfried nodded, beat it. They yelled as they uppercutted him. Now where were we? Gajil asked as he created a hammer from his hand. Your path ends here. Siegfried said as he avoided the hammer and hit Gajil with his sword and sent him midair. Taste the power of my sword. He said as dragged soul caliber against the floor making flames appear around it. Siegfried then lifted it and hit Gajil keeping him midair before landing one more devastating slash, sending Gajil into a wall and making his scales fall apart, I hoped I wouldn't have to rely on this power. He said. Watch out it's a monster. One of the phantom members yelled. Then you should have known better than to attack the children of this monster. Now you will all face my wrath. Makarov yelled in what sounded like a demonic voice that would make Nightmare nod his head in respect. At one moment Makarov noticed Siegfried and gave him a nod. To which Siegfried responded by giving him a thumbs up. All the while he got surrounded by a few familiar faces. In front of him was Elfman, Kana and Grey. Why don't you show your face like a real man? Beast soul. Scale bull. Elfman yelled as he crushed the floor beneath Siegfried. Someone is a lot more self-confident. Siegfried said as he jumped away and kicked Elfman in the face. Kana jumped in the air and tossed several cards at Siegfried, take this phantom knight. 
she said. Last time I checked, it was I who gave you and Levy gifts whenever I saved up. Siegfried said as he appeared behind Kana who looked shocked. What is that outfit? I'm gone for so long and you dress like that. He said as he pulls out a rope from one of his portals and ties her up. Ice make. Freeze Lancer. Grey called out as several ice lances aimed for Siegfried. Siegfried stepped over Kana and stabbed Soul Calibur into the floor, creating his own ice to block it, always use your fists before your head, isn't that your way Grey? It all you and Natsu know. Siegfried mocked. Who are you? How do you know our names? Kana demanded as she struggled in her binds. All you need to know is that I'm not your enemy. Siegfried replied. Then why did you and Gajul hit Natsu? Elfman demanded. Natsu demanded both of us to fight him when we were fighting amongst each other. Siegfried answered. Natsu picks a fight with everyone. Grey argued. And is it always with the enemy? Siegfried asked making them sweat drop. Crap, he has a point. Grey said with a shocked face. Then Gajul arrived with his scales back on his body as he started finishing up eating another piece of iron. Siegfried summoned a kunai and tossed it towards Kana. You three leave him to me. This is personal. Siegfried said as he prepared Soul Calibur for another scuffle. Well this is personal for us too. Elfman said. Yeah he took out our guild members. Grey added. Well one of them was my little sister. Siegfried snapped back scaring the three. No way am I going to spare someone who attacked my family. He said as he dashed at Gajil and crossed blades with him. All the while the three were confused, but Levy doesn't have siblings. She's an orphan isn't she? Elfman asked. Hey Kana, you've been in the guild the longest. Do you know Levy's brother? Grey asked. Kana was about to retort when suddenly a yellow flash appeared in her mind making her bite her finger, I can't say. Look we leave the fight to him. No arguments. She ordered. All the while Siegfried continued clashing blades with Gajil. The fight was starting to lean toward Siegfried's favor. Gajil was losing patience and kept applying pressure and brute force on his attacks. Siegfried managed to avoid losing his balance and kept blocking the attacks and started to overwhelm Gajil with his increasing speed. The two pushed each other back again once more, that's it, I'm pouring everything I have into this one. Iron Dragon's roar. Gajil yelled as he put everything he had into the technique. Siegfried revealed his eyes had turned red with a six-pointed star, Susanu. He yelled as he was suddenly engulfed by purple flame surrounding a skeleton as it transformed into masked warrior with a shield and sword. The explosion connected, but before Gajil could gloat, the Susanu smacked him away with its shield. Gajil recovered and looked up at the 40-foot-tall legless behemoth in front of him. This foreign magic made him feel annoyed as his opponent is far from surrendering. Siegfried floated in the middle of his armored warrior with his arms crossed. You have your scales, but I have my Susanu. Shall we end this red fox? Siegfried asked. Steel Dragon Sword. Gajil yelled out as he ran directly at the Susanu and slashed at him multiple times with as much pressure he could apply. Only the Susanu stood tall with a couple of minor cracks that were barely noticeable, brute force cannot save you here Dragon Slayer. Siegfried said as he slammed his sword down and knocked away the members of Phantom Lord before trying to slash at Gajil. Do not delay the inevitable. Give in and face judgment. He said as he fired an Amaterasu flame at him. You wish. I'll kick your ass. Armor or no armor. Gajil exclaimed as he turned both his fists into mallets. Siegfried merely flicked Gajil away as he ran directly at him, you are a fool. He said. Gajil snarled, looking away he saw a pile of metal still waiting for him. Taking his chance, he recklessly dashed towards his snack in hopes of fueling up. Only to be stopped by the fact that they were set on fire by the Amaterasu flames. Ignoring that, he decided to eat them anyway, only to learn the hard way by falling on his knees and gagging on the burning sensation. Before Siegfried could continue his assault on the downed dragon slayer. He heard crashing and looked up to see Makarov was falling. Siegfried's eyes widened as he moved as quickly as he could and caught him with a Susanu arm. Turning back he saw Gajil had ran off to fight another day and didn't bother looking for him. However that was when Siegfried noticed many more members of the Phantom Lord Guild had arrived and surrounded Fairy Tail. Fairy Tail. This battle is lost for now. Retreat with your downed master while I hold them off. Siegfried ordered as he gently placed Makarov in the middle of them. Master? Everyone said as they surrounded Makarov. We need to retreat at once. Urza ordered. Why? We can still beat them. Grey argued only for Urza to cry on his chest. We can't, not without the master. Urza said as Fairy Tail's numbers started to get cut down. Grey couldn't argue with Urza and followed her lead by helping get Makarov out here. All the while Siegfried stood in front of the retreating guild members and started keeping Phantom from following them. At one point he slammed his sword down onto a group that surrounded Macau who was heavily wounded. Macau looked up with surprise on his face, thanks, who are you by the way? He asked. The heir of the original dragon slayer. Siegfried replied cryptically. 
The cow didn't bother asking for details and decided to cut his losses while Siegfried kept pushing the enemy back. Although he did notice Natsu beating up some random mage in the corner. Tell me where Lucy is. Natsu demanded. I don't know what you're talking about. I swear. The mage lied. I'll burn you to a crisp if you don't tell me. Natsu threatened as the flames came out of his mouth. Okay I'll tell you. The mage said. Good, because when I'm done with you. You and all of your stinking guild will know why you don't mess with fairy tale. You picked the wrong day to kidnap one our own. Natsu barked. Kidnapping. Knowing Natsu he's going to find some trouble. I can't take any risks. Siegfried thought as he powered down his Susanoo. Sharingan. Jinjutsu. He said making some of the guild members suddenly feel exhausted and fall down. Looking around he saw more coming his way while Natsu was dragging one of them out the door. Siegfried couldn't risk letting Phantom go after Makarov or Natsu, so he pulled out a key from one of his portals. Eight of the White Ram. Ares. Siegfried said as he infused the key with his magical energy. Suddenly a pink-haired girl with brown horns appeared, what do you need, big brother? She asked. Ares, I kind of need you to follow some pink-haired guy with a scarf dragging some mage. Just keep your distance and step in if you can. Siegfried said before shooting a fireball at the crowd of phantom members. Just remember the golden rule we set up okay. There's no shame in using it. He said. Ares nodded, right, if I get into trouble or I don't think I can handle it. I'll go back to the celestial realm. She said before running out to look for Natsu. All the while, he finally noticed Gajil standing over the pillars connected to the upper part of the guild. The dragon slayer was smirking as he stood beside Arya of the Element 4. Siegfried snarled but quickly cooled down as to avoid letting his emotions take control of him. However, he knew he couldn't stay here forever and allow his strength to diminish. So with one last move, he jumped out of the guild hall doors and made several hand seals. This attack was made by formerly most powerful Ichiha, Madara. Siegfried watched as the horde of phantom lord wizards running at him. Fire style. Great fire annihilation. He said as he sent a giant sea of fire towards the guild. The guild members went wide-eyed and immediately tried to either run or block the attack. One member, her name is Sue, arrogantly used her mirror magic to catch some of the flames. However it was like trying to drain an ocean by using a plastic shovel and bucket from a beach. In a matter of moments, the flames kept returning until the entire technique started to burn her alive. Among her fellow comrades, she was the one who screamed the loudest as he flesh began to peel off. Aya aya. However, she was among the few that had survived and would be able to continue their career as a mage. Agile went wide-eyed at the level of brutality. Sure he couldn't care less about all those losers, but this was just one man who stomped on the guild. It was because of the interruption and his own strength that Siegfried didn't demolish the entire guild hall. There was no way Oze would allow Siegfried to continue being a thorn to Phantom's side. If Gajil were a coward, he would be shaking at the sight of Siegfried slowly turning his back and walk away. All the while ignoring the screams of suffering and pleading. As if this was just an ordinary day for him. Better yet, as if this was a norm for him. With Ares, a celestial spirit was huffing as she had trouble keeping up with Natsu. The dragon slayer was pretty fast, and Ares herself didn't have much stamina to continue following him. So it was thanks to the fact that where he was going was fairly close. Ares then stopped as she noticed Lucy was standing on the ledge of a tower. All before she fell off backwards. Oh no. Ares said as she prepared her magic. Natsu. Lucy. Wool cushion. Ares called out as a giant puff of wool covered the ground. Natsu grabbed Lucy just before they landed on the wool safe and sound. Just as the celestial spirit was about to celebrate, she blushed at the sight of how they landed. Part of Natsu's face was covered by Lucy's large breasts. Made it just in time. Natsu said in a muffled voice. Yeah, thank you. I knew you'd save me. Lucy said gratefully despite her provocative position. Um guys, I think it was the fluffy sheep lady who saved you guys. Happy said pointing towards Ares who looked scared and hid behind a wall. Who the heck is that? Natsu asked. Ares didn't bother to stay and explain herself. So all she did was bow her head before poofing away in a cloud of smoke. Was that a celestial spirit? Lucy asked. Later, fairy tale guild hall. Things weren't going so well in the guild. A lot of people were injured, and Macau along with Kana were trying to lead things while Makarov was being tended to by Purusika in her hut. With that, Lucy was also safely brought back by Natsu. Lucy however blamed herself for everything when she revealed that her father, Jude, had paid Phantom to retrieve her. Naturally Lucy broke down in tears and blamed herself despite her claims that she loves fairy tale and doesn't want anyone to get her because of her father's actions. Naturally the guild didn't care about that and still supported her despite the fact that she's a runaway. They also blamed Phantom rather than her father who requested the job. Finally there was Kana who tried using her card reading to find Mystigan. Unaware that he was completing his own mission to defeat the many subdivisions of Phantom Lord. 
Then there was Marahin who was pleading for Laxus to help them. Sadly the most powerful fairy tale wizard refused to help on the count that it's not his fight. How convenient, do me a favor, if that old geezer manages to pull through this, tell him he's over the hill and needs to hand the guild over to me. Laxa says with a laugh. Marahin proceeded to shut him up by punching the lacrima, I don't understand, how can someone in the guild be so cruel? She said while sobbing. Then suddenly the whole hall started shaking. Everyone in Magnolia Town watched as a castle with spider-like robotic legs approached. Everyone in the guild ran out and watched as the mechanized castle slowly made their way to the guild. Well they were gawking at it and were too shocked at the thought of Phantom being this desperate to attack them. The cannon revealed itself and extended before preparing to fire. Urza quickly used her requip magic and equipped her adamantine armor. Stay back. Urza ordered as she prepared to take on the blast. However, instead of receiving the blast. The water started to bubble up before a large crimson-colored snake appeared and started pulling on one of the legs. What the hell is that? Natsu asked as his eyes bulged out of their sockets. Back with the snake an armored man can be seen on the top, this is reckless, but I owe you one for last time Sieg. The snake said as he held on. Thank you Garaga, I can take it from here. Do you think you can withstand my Susanu? Siegfried asked. I think I can, stop giving me too little credit. Go on and kick some ass for that levy girl. Garaga said as Siegfried nodded. Susanu? Siegfried said as he slowly entered his partially complete Susanu and started pulling on the mechanical leg. Oof, this thing really is heavy and kind of hot. Just pull on it as fast as you can. Garaga said as the weight of the jutsu was a bit too much than he expected. Just a little more. Got it. Siegfried said as he bent the leg the wrong way making the whole castle shift out of balance. The real question is, was it enough? He asked. The cannon finished charging up and fired at the sky continuously until it ran out, I think you did it. You better go up there and hurry before it fires again. Garaga warned as he extended his head up as high as possible. Thank you my friend, I will see when the mission is over. Until next time. Siegfried said as he powered down and jumped up to the cannon nozzle. Inside the cannon room, Naruto Shippuden and Astadara theme, Siegfried made it inside to see a giant lacrima powering up the cannon. As barbaric as it sounds, Siegfried's only chance was to destroy the lacrima to prevent it from firing again. Siegfried then extended his arm and summoned Balming to his side and prepared to channel his magical energy into the sword and destroy the lacrima. Blue fire. Someone yelled. Siegfried wasted no time and substituted with a random tool in his place. Looking back, he saw some black and white haired man dressed in a guy, as if he were from some bad karate movie. I cannot allow you to destroy that lacrima. Said the fake karate master. You're in my way. Siegfried said as he prepared to strike with his sword. If you wish to perish. Then stay where you are. He said. You are no match for a member of the element 4. For I, Totemaru, will defeat you. Totemaru said as he revealed his own katana. The two dashed at each other with considerable speed and clashed blades until Siegfried forced him back. Totemaru quickly ran up the wall and shot some orange fire directly at him. Siegfried countered by slamming his palms onto the ground, making the floor rise up and block it. Totemaru narrowed his eyes as he continued to blow fire. Now take this. Totemaru said as he slashed at Siegfried who blocked the attack. Amaterasu. Siegfried said as he launched the black fire at Totemaru. Ah, I can control any fire. That's why A-A-A-H-H-H. Totemaru yelled as it hit his shoulder. What is this? Why can't I put it out? He screams in pain. Do you really believe I would attack Phantom Lord without researching you? A group such as yourselves have made enough of a name to reveal your identities to the public. Along with your most common abilities depending on your rank. Siegfried said before reappearing behind the fire mage. What does that have to do with this fire? Totemaru asked as he tried to keep fighting despite the pain. Because that is a Madarasu, a special fire only capable of being used by the Sharingan. Siegfried answered as he kept blocking and parrying the sword attacks. Sharingan. But that's a rare ability only found in the elemental nations. There's only one person left in that continent let alone the world with that power. Totemaru said with shock clearly evident in his voice. Let's just say Sasuke Chiha owed me a favor in the past life. Now Begin, Inferno style. Hanoi Kazuchi. Before Totemaru realized it, he was impaled by more black flames that stabbed right through him. Who are you? Totemaru asked as he clutched his wounds. I am the Azure Knight. Totemaru's eyes widened at the claim. Not only did you mongrels attack my sister, but you attacked my former home as well as put the lives of many citizens in danger. Your punishment along with anyone who gets in my way is death. Siegfried finished as he jabbed Balming through his heart before forcefully pushing the bloody fire mage's body onto the ground. No way. Totemaru muttered as his bloodshot eyes stayed wide open and watched as Siegfried charged his father's sword and fired a powerful blue beam at the lacrima, causing its destruction. The first step is done. Siegfried said as he sheathed his sword and continued onward. 
only to stop as he felt the whole structure shake. What is this? He asked as he felt a shifting change in the guild hall. Outside, everyone in the guild started to lose their balance as the entire Phantom Lord guild hall turned into some sort of robotic giant. If an I'm was able to watch an I'm, then Oze must be a Weibo with how much he's been watching. Seriously, a giant laser cannon and now some sort of giant robot. What next to Biju? Regardless of whatever was going to happen, a team consisting of Urza, Natsu, Grey, Elfman and Happy already started making their way across the ocean towards the hall, hoping to stop the enemy guild. This isn't good, but we can't stop fighting. Kana said. Everyone stand your ground. Macau ordered as they kept fighting those ghost-like entities in the skies. As they continued to fight, Lucy suddenly exited the guild wearing one of Marahan's dresses. A few people quickly realized that it was just Marahan using her transformation magic. Hopefully for her, Oze wouldn't notice the difference. Leave them alone. I'm the one that you're after. I'll surrender if you swear to stop attacking our guild. Marahan said in Lucy's voice. Sadly Oze did see through her disguise, nice transformation, but you can't fool me young lady. He said as Marahan dropped her transformation. As Marahan cried into her hands at how useless she felt. A green magic circle appeared right under her and took her away. Leaving a stunned Kana who could only fear what Oze would do to her. Back with Siegfried, the Azure Knight continued to make his way down the halls of the hall turned into some sort of machine. All the while he wasn't aware of Oze's next plan of attack on Fairy Tail. As he continued to make his way through the hall, he saw a large lump coming from the ground, revealing a green-haired man with a monocle and a brown suit. Comment circa va. My name is Sol. Monsieur Sol. Sol said introducing himself. To Sui Siegfried Naruto, Le Chevalier Azur. Ravi de Vaus Renkentrer. I am Siegfried Naruto, the Azure Knight. Nice to meet you. Siegfried said impressing Sol. Aus Perlasi Francais. Can you speak French as well? Sol asked. Siegfried drew Baoming, Ui, I also know, Deutsch, Zongwen, Espanol, Ruski and Italiano. He answered. Oh how interesting. However I cannot allow you to proceed with whatever your intentions are, Monami. Sol said with an evil smile. Siegfried attempted to slash at Sol who proved to be quite nimble and attempted to wrap around him. All the while the Earth Mage attempted to extract information many years ago. Just as Siegfried enhanced his speed by revealing his magical circuits, a statue appeared revealing a pink-haired woman in a white dress with a gold horn sticking out of her forehead. Is this not Franny? Your beloved? Sol asked. Siegfried narrowed his eyes as his eyes changed, oh my, the fabled Sharingan. It is said to see past illusions can it not. Sadly, this is very real and you cannot escape it. No matter how powerful those eyes of yours are. Sol explained with a smirk. The statue just stared at Siegfried with her eyes being discolored. It didn't take much time to realize that this was meant to torture his mind. That was Inferno's job and someone as petty as Sol. Why did you allow me to die Siegfried? Fran asked in a menacing tone. Sol was about to make a remark only for Siegfried to decapitate her. Fran was never able to speak in complete sentences. He said. Then suddenly a blonde-haired woman with green eyes appeared. You abandoned your home. You abandoned the life I gave you. How could you betray your own mother? She yelled. Siegfried stabbed the statue through the mouth, I actually have no argument for this one. Then again, my soul is already damned. He said lacking emotion. Then a brown-haired young man in a suit appeared, you stained my legacy. He said before you lack originality. Siegfried commented. Soul appeared behind him and activated a magic circle behind him, I will force you to relive all of your pain. I will defeat you. Now suffer Siegfried Naruto. He said. However, instead of expecting Siegfried to scream in pain and succumb to his magic, the Azure Knight was surrounded by a dark aura and flames. Once more Nightmare appeared and lifted Soul by his head. No matter how deep you dive into his mind. I regret none of his actions you pesky human. Nightmare said as he tossed him into a wall making it shatter. As the wall shattered, Marahin can be seen trapped within the arm joints of the giant. As she struggled to break free of Oze's punishment only to notice the fight between Soul and Siegfried. The white-haired haired barmaid could only watch as a monster slowly approached Soul's feeble form. What is this? Where is the one known as Siegfried? Sol asked as he tried to retreat. I am the nightmare born from Soul Edge. Now you perish. Nightmare said as he started engulfing Soul in flames. Non non non. It was just a test. It was a way of helping you. You are the creme la creme. Sol lied only for the flames to reach his entire body. Siegfried and I are two different entities. Yet we have one belief that can both agree on. Nightmare said as he stabbed into Soul with Soul Edge. Siegfried Naruto is a wild animal and unlike filth like you. He attempts to restrict himself. That so long as he takes all the scum of the world down to hell with him. So long as he lives. This world will have more time to prepare and foolishly attempt to stop Armageddon. This is the end soul of the element 4. The demonic knight said finishing his monologue. Please. 
have mercy. Soul pleaded as his flesh was slowly being peeled off. Then you should have stayed away from fairy tale. Nightmare replied as he let Soul drop. All that anyone could see and hear was a screaming man that was on fire. Before he plummeted to his death and left his corpse floating in the river. There are many souls nearby. Perhaps this phantom lord will solve my hunger. Nightmare said as he began to walk away. Naruto. Nightmare suddenly felt his entire body stop. What is this? How did you regain control Siegfried? Nightmare demanded to know as he was forcefully turned to the sound of the voice. As he looked, they saw Marahan trapped within the joints of giant's arm joints, leave her, we have no time to waste on a single soul. He said as he tried to turn. Why would you obey? I command you to give me control. Nightmare said continuing to bark orders only for his armor to slowly disappear. No, I won't let you take control. I'm not turning my back on fairy tale again. Siegfried said as he forcefully expelled Nightmare yet again. Siegfried fell on his knees as he clutched his chest, can't stop now. He said as he used his circuits to jump over to the mechanical arm. As he appeared in front of Marahin. He poured every little bit of magic he could muster into his arms as he forced the joint to open before lifting Marahin out of her bind. However, he didn't expect the shorter girl to extend her arms and pull off his helmet. It really is you she said tearfully as she dropped his helmet. Siegfried didn't show any emotion as he looked at her, how did you know it was me? He asked feeling curious. I heard that monster mention you and him were the same thing. I couldn't believe it, but I had to try to get your attention. Mira answered before wrapping her arms around him and crying onto his chest. I'm so sorry I'm so 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 sorry. She said as she began to weep. Siegfried gently put her arms down and held her hands as he looked directly into her blue eyes, what are you apologizing for? He asked. For everything I pushed you away. Not just Urza. We all did. Natsu, Grey, Laxus, none of us, except for Kana and Levi. Marahin said confessing her sins. That no longer matters. The damage is beyond repair. Siegfried said. Marahin could only look down in shame, I understand, I can't forgive myself for, I wasn't talking about that. He said interrupting her. Mira looked up at his cold eyes, they weren't the same as before, I am not the same Naruto you once knew. He said as he let go of her arms. But what do you mean? Marahin asked before she was picked up in a bridal carry which made her blush. I do not have time to explain. You will need to make your way back down on your own. Naruto said as he didn't want to use up too much energy to use Kamui down there and back up. Marahin remained silent as Naruto jumped back through the hole he created, don't follow me. He said as he continued to run. Marahin could only slowly extend her hand toward Siegfried. As she tried to reach for him, all she could do was see a younger child slowly walking away from the fairy tale guild by himself in the middle of the night. The barmaid reached for a locket that she kept around her neck. It was a blue locket that had an inscription on the back. Marahin let her tears run down her cheeks as she read the inscription. Dear Mira-chan, I hope you keep this as a sign of friendship so you can keep pictures of your precious people. She opened the locket up and it revealed a photo of her deceased sister Lasana from her younger years. The other side was empty, but it had a name. For Naruto, of course the only other person besides Master Makarov that had photos of Siegfried was Levi. Levi would never allow anyone else to take away the photos of her surrogate brother. Levi may be some petite girl with no physical strength to match her level of intelligence, but she knew exactly when to become dangerous. I'm so sorry Marahin kept muttering as she stayed put. But Siegfried, the Azure Knight managed to recall his helmet and found his way on the surface of the machine. Looking up he can see the heavy rain hitting his armor. It was a good thing he took all his armor to get their basic necessities tweaked. The last thing he needed was to be clumsy and start falling on the slippery ground. Siegfried cut his thoughts short as he saw a blue-haired haired woman with an umbrella and an emotionless face that could make the Kazakiage proud. Drip drip drop, Juvia is the rain woman. She said. You aren't the type that murders people to prove their own existence are you? Siegfried asked. The woman just stared at him and kept that same blank look. Two minutes passed and neither one of them said anything after that strange comment. Then suddenly a faint tick mark appeared on Juvia's forehead. What kind of sick person do you think I am? Juvia yelled in annoyance. I've been around many places Juvia San. I would like to tell you all about them, but you are my enemy and time is not my ally. Siegfried stated as he summoned his mother's sword this time. Juvia nodded, I commend you for making it this far. However this is where your path ends. She stated as the water started to surround her. Naruto ship you to Nostadara theme, you manipulate the water. Is it safe to assume the rain is under your control as well? Siegfried asked only to earn a powerful glare from Juvia who fired her water like a cannon. I hit a sensitive spot didn't I? He asked. You know nothing. Water slicer. She said as water came directly at Siegfried with the intent to cut through him. Siegfried narrowly dodged it as he formed hand seals, this is stupid and reckless, but it's worth a try. Let's see how far you can control water. He said finishing the seals. Water style. Water shark bomb jutsu. 
he said as several sharks came from the rain and went directly towards her. Duvia blinked twice as her magic seemed to hesitate but was able to stop the sharks in time. All the while leaving Siegfried to collect more data on his opponent. So far, she can manipulate water as well as cause rain. Leaving his water ninjutsu even more pointless since she can stop it but not without some resistance. He will have to rely on fire and lightning again as he did with Gagiel. I do not know what that was or how you briefly controlled my water. But that would be the last thing you do. Water cane. She said as she ended up hitting Siegfried who didn't dodge in time. Siegfried started to tumble back but managed to regain his balance. Looking up he could see that she managed to transform herself into water and tried to splash at him. Jumping away, Siegfried decided to be cliché and spam that one technique that the Acha had taught him. Seriously, not even he used clones as much in either lifetime. I know, Hervey Sage and Kakashi Sensei had an arsenal and they just assume, no, you don't need a jutsu from me. Last time I checked I'm not Lee. Naruto said in his head. True, Lee used any resource he could get his hands on to get strong. Although he never considered picking up weapons. Siegfried thought in agreement as he avoided several more splashes. Kinda funny how the team has all those jutsus and he uses his fireballs like they're glasses of water. Naruto thought with a laugh. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Siegfried called out as he jumped over Juvia and hit her head on which created a small mist. However Juvia came back together keeping that emotionless face so you can control fire. We are opposite and it will take the one with the stronger will to win. She said. Let it be. Water style. Hidden mist jutsu. Siegfried called out as he created the thickest fog he could muster. Trivial. Juvia said as she slowly removed the water from the mist in order to make the air more dry. Siegfried took his chance to create four clones and gave them a signal with his hand. He along with three of the clones kept their distance and stayed in a certain angle to prepare themselves. The last clone went around Juvia and performed the fireball jutsu once more which caught her attention. Seeing this as a reckless act, Juvia trapped the clone in a dome of water called Water Lock before she could say anything to mock his futile behavior. Juvia was soon barraged by a mix of lightning and fire ninjutsu. Fire style. Fire dragon jutsu. Lightning style. Lightning dragon jutsu. Lightning style. Electromagnetic murder. Fire style. Phoenix flower jutsu. Juvia quickly tried to escape using her watery form, but was soon blocked by the fire jutsu. While the lightning techniques managed to conduct to the water around her which electrocuted her body making her collapse. It didn't stop there as Siegfried placed a seal on Clarent which allowed it to conduct his lightning affinity. Juvia once again tried to use her watery form to avoid the attack. However this mistake was not so easy to catch for her and she found herself being electrocuted even further. With each passing strike, he could hear her anguish and pain. All the while the rain started to pour harder to the point he thought that there was lightning in the clouds. That's when he tripped her and aimed his sword at her neck. End of song, the rain. It is manipulated by your emotions. Is it not? Siegfried asked as he kept his weapon aimed at the water mage. Juvia snarled as she faced away from him, as if you would understand how I feel. I do not understand why the rain follows me. A rain woman who doesn't understand her own power. She said the last part aimed as an insult towards herself. Why are you following Ose? He is clearly a terrorist bent on destroying anything in his path. Siegfried asked. Master Ose is the only one who understood my pain. He gave me a purpose. While well, I was a casted aside. I never had friends or a family. So even if it means having to ending the lives of others. Juvia said with an angry face. Siegfried said nothing and remained impassive despite his helmet covering his face, what now? Are you going to mock me? To call me insane? She asked. Siegfried took off his helmet and activated his Manjiku Sharingan, Tsukiyomi. He said as she met his gaze. Three seconds later Juvia fell on her back and started panting. All the while she looked around and gripped her head. What was that? She asked. It was my memories. Siegfried answered. Ak air on G-string not that kind of G-string you perverts. It can't be true. How much suffering have you really gone through? There is no way you should still be sane. Juvia said pointing her finger at him accusingly. Siegfried closed his eyes and opened them revealing his normal green eyes, it's the truth Juvia san, I contain a demon known as Inferno. Every moment of every day I continue to battle it for control of my body. For when I die or let go of the cursed sword, it will corrupt the next person and continue an endless cycle. He explained. Juvia started wiping her tears away, and why don't you finish me off? She asked knowing he's beyond the point of believing that killing is wrong. I am beyond saving, however that does not mean I can try helping others. You are not a bad person Juvia San. You are doing as you are told by someone who sheltered you from the rain. You were alone and didn't have anyone like I did growing up. Siegfried answered as he sheathed his sword and extended his hand. You can end this now Juvia San. You can leave Phantom because Ose only sees his guild as a tool. He said. But where will I go? 
Juvia asked. You can join Fairy Tail. Siegfried answered. But, I hurt their friend Lucy. We're still after her in fact. Juvia said doubting that possibility. Fairy Tail is a family and family never turns their back on anyone. Join Fairy Tail Juvia San and they can give you something that you really desire. Siegfried said. What is that? Juvia asked curiously. Siegfried managed to crack a smile, love. He answered. Juvia's eyes started to water as she heard that. It all made sense, she felt some acceptance, but that's only because she was used as an example of power. As an extra soldier for an army under a tyrant. All the while she never felt love or friendship or even developed a real relationship of any kind with anyone in Phantom. So in that moment, Juvia quickly got up and grabbed onto Siegfried before crying her eyes out. It's okay Juvia-san, when this is over I'll speak to Master Makarov about joining his guild. Siegfried said as he pulled out. Juvia nodded happily, for now you should surrender yourself in order to avoid the crossfire. I still need to defeat Arya and Oze. He said. I want to help. Juvia said. No, I'm too reckless and I don't work so well in teams. I'll find you when this is over. Siegfried said as he placed his helmet back on and ran off. As Juvia stood there, Grey eventually arrived as well and noticed Juvia. But before he could challenge her to a fight under the assumption that she was a threat. He felt emotions coming from the rain as it slowly died down. This rain is so gloomy. Juvia turned to look at Grey with an evil look in her eyes. Yet, it's feeling better. It reminds me of something, but I can't put my finger on it. Like there's a better tomorrow or something weird like that. He said as the rain stopped and the clouds cleared up. That's nice. He commented about the beautiful sky. The blue sky. I've never seen anything like it. Juvia said as she was stunned. Seriously? Well here you go. It's a really pretty thing. Grey said. It's beautiful. Juvia said admiring its beauty. Then it hit her, it was her emotions that allowed the rain to continue endlessly. Even if she believed that Ose had granted her the gift of acceptance, it never changed her mindset. Yet it was now that she met a complete stranger. Someone with a broken past leading up to stumbling upon a power that is out of his control. While Siegfried traveled alone, he decided to give a complete stranger like Juvia a chance at a fresh start. You it may be nice, but at the end of the day it's gone. Grey said earning a surprise face from Juvia. It's sad to say, but it's really one of those moments when you realize you have to appreciate everything you have. If not, you could live your life and regret thinking about what could have happened. He continued. Regret? Juvia asked. That's right. Grey said with a sigh. You know when I lost my home. I was taken in by a lady named Ur who trained me. A while later I told her off about how I thought she was holding me back and turned my back on her when I decided to go after the monster that destroyed my home. Instead, I almost got killed and my teacher sacrificed herself to forever contain the creature in suspended animation. He explained as he unintentionally poured his heart out. So you lost someone. Juvia said feeling bad as Grey nodded. Yeah, I also lost another person who just wanted to be my friend. Everyone in my guild pushed away the ball of sunshine. We never believed it would, but one day, he was injured. One of us took it too far and he ran away during the middle of the night. Because of that, my generation of the guild betrayed our own values. Gray finished as he rubbed his eyes. Juvia smiled, but that's why you want to save your friend Lucy, right? Because none of you want to repeat the same mistake. She said. That's right, but you're here to stop me, right? Gray asked with narrowed eyes. Juvia blushed, nope, I give up. You win. She said turning around. Hey, where are you going? Come back and fight me. Gray yelled. And thus a beautiful relationship started. A.N. More or less the same as canon, but Juvia is too chicken to join for now. Back with Siegfried, Element 4, Sol and Totemaru are dead, and that Juvia woman is willing to defect. That leaves one more member, Oze and Gajul if he gets in the way. Siegfried thought as he continued to make his way over to Guildmaster. Suddenly Siegfried was hit by a giant gust of wind. As he recovered, he saw a small tornado appear at the center of the hall, revealing a man in a green coat and hat wearing bandages over his eyes. My name is Arya. I am the strongest of the Element 4. Arya said introducing himself. Fire, earth, water, and that must make you wind. Am I correct? Siegfried asked. That is correct, you will not be able to win this fight. Arya claimed. That is where you are wrong. I am also attuned to wind along with fire, lightning with a little bit of earth and water. You are the one that is outclassed here scum. Siegfried stated as he started forming hand seals at a quicker pace. Zetsu? Arya calls out as he sends several spaces of air. Fire style. Phoenix fire jutsu. Siegfried calls out as both attacks cancel each other out. There is always someone better than you. I guess the same can be said about Totemaru if he fell before your hands. Arya stated. Lightning style. Lightning dragon jutsu. Siegfried called out as he aimed his technique for the seemingly blind man. Only for him to disappear at the last second. 
Siegfried kept his eyes open as to where the wind mage is hiding. Only to hear his voice and start to listen in for his presence. I will allow you to join your master in his suffering. Arya states as he appears right behind Siegfried. Metsu. He says as Siegfried is surrounded by two purple magic seals. So sad, yes any wizard caught in my Metsu will be completely drained of their powers. He states as tears fall from under his bandages. Great clone explosion. Siegfried says as he suddenly explodes sending Arya flying back. Did he really commit suicide to escape my technique? Arya asked only to be hit with a ball of flames. Looking back, he saw Siegfried standing tall with Clarent in his hands, but how? He asked. Clone magic with ninjutsu. Siegfried answered. Ingenious, I guess it's time I start taking my battles more seriously. He says as he reveals his strange violet-colored eyes. Now Azure Knight. Step into zero airspace of death. He says as he creates a whirlwind around him. Let me show you my eyes. Behold the Manjikyu Sharingan before you perish. Siegfried says as he disappears in a burst of smoke. Where is he now? Arya asked as he tries to look around only to meet Siegfried's gaze. His eyes were red with a three-pointed black shuriken, surrounded by his now completely black sclera, Tsukiyomi. He said. Arya's mind, naturally you would be trapped here for 72 hours while in actuality 3 seconds. However I have no time to waste. Siegfried said as he left Arya by himself in a world where the sky is red and everything is else black. No. I cannot fall here. I am the prince of the element 4. Arya stated before his eyes went wide and he clutched his chest. Reality, Siegfried blinked only once as Clarin penetrated Arya's chest cavity. As he slowly pulled out his sword, Arya fell to his knees and blinked a couple times. So sad Arya said before the upper half of his head was cleaved off. It's disgusting, but it must be done. At least I don't need to destroy the eyes since they don't work like mine. Siegfried stated as he abandoned the body to look for the next threat. Said threat arrived in the shape of a man clapping clapping in amusement, bravo. You are quite keen. Very impressive Azure Knight. Those Aporla. Siegfried said as he kept his sword up. I knew this would be fun, but never in my wildest dreams did I think it would be entertaining. You killed annihilated the Jupiter cannon, killed three of my element four, and made one of them turncoat, and even managed to bring my magic giant to its knees. Jose said as a dark cloud formed around him, I must simply return the favor for you entertaining me. He said. I will not fall, even if I have to sacrifice my life. Siegfried said as he prepared for the worst. Let me return it in full. Jose said as he summoned several ghoul-like figures towards him. Using a substitution, Siegfried was able to get out of the way in time. As the Azure Knight charged the enemy guildmaster, Jose proceeded to fire a tunnel-like beam at him. Siegfried managed to avoid the explosions around him and went in for the strikes. Jose grinned as he was able to avoid the slashes before grabbing his wrist and tossing him aside. Siegfried managed to land on his feet rather easily. Fascinating, I can tell you're holding back, but not intentionally. What is it? Guilt. Fear. I doubt you fear much of anything as your knight. If your stories are true, then fighting an elite such as myself is not something you back away from. Jose said as he never dropped that creepy smile of his. That is correct. Siegfried answered. However, all actions have some motivation. So why fight for fairy tale? And don't tell me it's for the kingdom. Whether or not my actions are justifiable, I can sense that bloodlust from when you finished Avaria. You can say it all you want, but you are no mindless animal. Jose stated as Siegfried remained silent. Jose smiled as he took a close look at that sword of his, that is Clarent isn't it? The sword of the previous detainee of fairy tale. I didn't take you for a thief. He said. Siegfried took a couple of breaths as he steeled himself. All the while he knew Jose was calculating his next move to either break him or make him attack wildly. Hence being able to leave an opening for a fatal attack. Of course that reminds me, Siegfried is an interesting name. Do you know where that name originated? Jose asked. A knight in the nation of Germany in the Far East. But they call him Sigurd in their language. Siegfried answered. That is correct, the legend states that he is the original dragon slayer. Not some mage who obtained the power to use elements, but a mere mortal man who killed a dragon with nothing but his sword and a strong will. Which reminds me of another rumor, of a young man who was among fairy tale. They nicknamed him Oberon, as he was the only one to be romantically involved with Titania. Those A said continuing his explanation. Where is this going? Siegfried asked. What I am saying is those two had a child of their own. One named after the father in his memory. However Titania had worse luck as she died cradling her infant child just shortly after his birth. A child named Siegfried who left his home. A deserter to be exact. Jose taunted as Siegfried's eyes were glowing brighter. I wonder how badly he disappointed his parents. Was all he said before blocked a heavy strike from Clarent. Hit a nerve did I? He asked with a grin. Siegfried didn't say anything as his body slowly started to transform once more. 
Those a laughed to think a former member of Fairy Tale. A deserter no less is returning to defend his own home. He said. Receive the punishment of darkness. Siegfried said as his entire body was engulfed in flames before revealing Nightmare once more. But Gagiel a while later, after giving Lucy a good beating, Gagiel started laughing as he stared at Lucy's feeble form. You're so dumb, I feel real sorry for you. Lucy said as she tried to stand up. Phantom Lord Ha. Huh? Ruler of the spirits. Oh please. You don't scare me at all. She said. You shouldn't have said that. Gagiel said as he gave her another good beating. It takes guts to run your mouth in a situation like this, princess. Make some noise. Not this trash talking crap. He said. Then why don't you just go ahead and dot it? Finish me. Then you're going to be sorry. Just you wait. Lucy said. Who's gonna make me? I'm curious. Gagiel challenged. Fairy tale. They'd never let you get away with this. They take revenge. They'll never stop and if I were you, I'd be watching my back from now on. Because the world's scariest guild will be after you so long as you live. Lucy exclaimed. So they'll be coming after me huh? Sounds like fun. Gagiel said as he prepared to hit Lucy some more. Only to be interrupted by the wall collapsing behind the other guild members. Among the debris, Nightmare can be seen with Soul Edge on his hand. Gagiel smirked as they didn't get to finish their match the last time as he still wanted vengeance for last time. Good, a real challenge. You ready for round three? Gagiel yelled. Nightmare responded by tossing something at the ground with his free hand. What you throwing the gold? Gagiel stopped himself as he noticed what he threw. Is that Master Oze? Asked one of the other phantom members. On the ground was none other than Oze. His eyes were rolled behind his head and also appeared to be bloodshot. Not only that, but they could see that his clothing was in tatters from the signs of burns and several stab wounds. I grant death for the weak. Nightmare said as he slashed at the downed phantom guild members, effectively killing them all. I am not scared. Gagiel said as he started sweating. What is this? Something this evil can't exist. Lucy said as she was lost for words. This place shall be your grave. Nightmare said as a dark cloud surrounded him as Soul Edge's eye widened as big as it possibly could. What are you? Some kind of monster. Gagiel asked as he started to cower at the killing intent directed at him. What if Naruto is mysterious in the fairy tale, and thanks for watching my video till the end. If you enjoy this content, then do consider subscribing to my channel, and leave a like if you guys need the next part comment down, and thanks for watching the video and see you guys next video.